Good afternoon, everyone. I am Melissa Dalton. I direct the Cooperative Defense Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to our event on the protection of civilians in U.S. partnered operations. Today's event and the work that has preceded it is a joint initiative uh, between CSIS, the Center for Civilians and Conflict and Interaction. Um, we're really excited to be rolling out some initial findings on this critical cross-sectoral issue. Much more work to be done um, here in Washington and in the field in this regard. Um, I will also be serving today as your responsible safety officer in the unlikely event of an emergency situation here at CSIS. I'll provide you some uh, instructions on how we can safely exit the building. Um, also want to state up front in terms of the funding support that our three organizations have received uh, to, to support this initiative. On the CSIS end, uh, we uh, leverage uh, CSIS general support funds for this initiative. Uh, Open Society Foundation supported the work of Civic and a private foundation uh, supported interactions efforts. The second pillar of the U.S. national defense strategy elevates the importance of security cooperation with allies and partners, but large and important critical issues remain in terms of how to responsibly pursue security cooperation with local partners as well as uh, regional allies around the globe. Um, today, we're going to be unpacking some of the key policy and practitioner considerations uh, surrounding these issues with a distinguished panel of, of experts, both within government and outside of government. Um, but first, I'd like to turn to uh, my two partners on this initiative, uh, Jenny McAvoy from Interaction and Dan Mahenty from, from Civic to provide um, a bit of a snapshot of our report um, and just a word about them both. Uh, Jenny McAvoy is Interactions Director of Protection and is responsible for developing and leading collaborative efforts of Interactions members and other interagency fora to enhance humanitarian protection. Prior to joining Interaction, Ms. McAvoy worked with UN OCHA Policy Branch of Protection and Displacement Section, and Dan Mahatney as the director of the U.S. program at the Center for Civilians in Conflict. Prior to Civic, Mr. Mahatney spent 16 years at the U.S. Department of State, where he created and led the Office of Security and Human Rights. So De Jenny and Dan, if I could welcome you to the podium. Uh, Civic and CSIS for the fabulous uh, collaboration that we've had um, as we dive into this topic. And speaking of partnerships, um, it's great to work in a partnership whereby the unique added value um, of each of us, um, I think, is, is genuinely maximized. Thanks to Melissa and Dan, to Hijab Shah from CSIS, and also two of our colleagues who have since moved on to Greener Pastures, Kelsey Hampton and Julie Snyder, who are co-authors um, on this report. Um, we approached this issue of um, protection of civilians in U.S. partnered operations fully cognizant that partnered military operations are not new. Um, and neither are efforts to positively shape the behavior of state and non-state actors uh, towards civilian populations. So we sought to pull together some knowledge and some recent experience um, of those working at this issue from humanitarian, diplomatic, and military perspectives and, and fields of expertise as a basis for policy options and to identify areas where changes would, be, um, would have positive effect. Um, before we get into the, the specific policy options um, and changes in practice um, that, that we'd like to see, I want to try to set the stage a little bit <clears throat> and try to describe um, the, the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and it's impossible for me to present a comprehensive picture in just a few minutes, um, but I'd like for us to be mindful of the current state of play. Um, in situations of armed conflict. Um, in 2017, 12 million people were newly displaced due to armed conflict. 
um, uh, within their national borders. Um, now, this is just the newly displaced uh, population. Um, and they add to an existing internally displaced population of 40 million and more than 25 uh, million refugees. This is an increase um, on 2016 of 6.9 million um, internal displacements um, and is the greatest number of internally displaced people in one year since we started tracking these numbers systematically. Um, and let's remember that once you are displaced, the average uh, total time of displacement is 17 years. So that's 17 years in, in limbo. Now, a lot of this internal displacement is, um, is concentrated in, in some of the big conflicts happening right now, particularly Syria, Iraq, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also includes Afghanistan, Somalia, Nigeria, and, and other contexts. Um, and I think it's important to be mindful that we're concerned not just for civilian casualties, um, but damage to infrastructure, uh, certainly displacement, um, explosive remnants of war, and, and so on. Um, I want to highlight in particular um, Yemen, um, where we face uh, amongst the, the, the worst of all possible scenarios. Currently, there's an estimated 22 million people affected by the ongoing uh, military operations combined with economic collapse um, and restrictions on humanitarian activity. In a six-month period, from December of last year through the end of May this year, uh, we saw more than 1,800 civilian casualties um, in Yemen. Um, over 2,000 um, instances of public infrastructure and residences uh, suffering damage. Um, and all of this, of course, has implications for day-to-day -day security, uh, food security, public health, and access to emergency medical care. Currently, 30% of children under five in Yemen suffer from malnutrition. Um, there have been at least three cholera outbreaks in the past couple of years, um, and 11 million people in Yemen right now face pre-famine conditions. So today, we're fortunate to have this panel of experts speaking from diverse perspectives to reflect on these situations um, and the opportunities to positively and constructively shape better outcomes for civilians by addressing the, the risks that arise in the context of partnered operations. Um, and in this respect, I just want to highlight a, a few highlights. Um, these are some of the things that, that I think of in, in terms of uh, the, the primary risks um, or, or the source of risks in partnered operations. Um, one is the risk that can occur as a result of communications or intelligence gaps or the lack of interoperable systems uh, between jointly operating partner forces. Um, and civilians fall through these gaps. <clears throat> for example, a failure to jointly anticipate and plan for displacement or an evacuation of a civilian population um, may not be the consequence of overt abuses, but a lack of preparedness can, can mean devastating consequences. Um, secondly, the internal coherence of, of policy objectives um, is absolutely indispensable. Um, policy coherence may be lacking where, for example, security partnerships have gradually evolved um, and there is no specific inflection point whereby the potential implications for a civilian population are factored into decision making. Misaligned objectives among partnered forces can lead to um, differences in priorities and means and operational posture. Minimally, um, it will mean uh, uncertainty as to who is meant to be doing what in the context of a specific operation for the protection of civilians. And on this, I don't think we can afford to be overly prescriptive, but fundamentally embrace the notion that our investment in capabilities to anticipate and minimize civilian harm should match the type and scale of the partnership and jointly conducted operations. Finally, just to emphasize that the US policy environment and, com and command posture can help quite a lot. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate uh, the influence of the signals um, that the United States sends and can send through its own command posture um, and the potential impact of strengthened policy and practice to shape its security partnerships. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dan Mahanti.
Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I realize I much prefer being at the podium than I do sitting in a panel like this because nobody can see how well I shine my shoes or what kind of socks I'm wearing. So, <laughs> so I appreciate being given the chance to, to speak from, <laughs> from the podium. Um, so before I hand it over to uh, Mark and the rest of the panel to uh, fully endorse all of the recommendations in our report, um, I thought I'd just offer a couple of uh, comments in addition to what uh, Jenny so masterfully laid out, just to give you a sense of, um, of why we wrote the report and how we wrote it, um, and, and maybe a couple of the findings that I'll, I'll mention, um, but I'll try not to be duplicative or redundant um, in terms of what, what Jenny said. But before I do, I do just want to acknowledge first, um, you know, Civic and my personal gratitude uh, to CSIS in particular for giving us the amazing uh, space and convening power that they've got to bring together uh, people from all walks uh, to talk about an issue. We had, uh, in, on two occasions, rooms full of practitioners from the Department of Defense to include um, the special operations community, but also um, some very well-renowned and respected uh, humanitarian practitioners. And it wasn't always uh, without its tension, but I think it led to a much more constructive dialogue. And the second thing I want to uh, the second group I want to acknowledge are many of the people in this room and, and not in this room who participated in the workshops uh, and provided their input, uh, and it is actually um, on their shoulders that this kind of, uh, the success of this project, if we have any, uh, rests. So thanks, thanks to you all. And I have to say that the, the report was designed intentionally to include uh, the practical experiences of practitioners. Um, and so it is not your typical pure research product with a lot of footnotes and endnotes, um, but it directly derives from, from people's experience. Um, and why did we write the report? And Jenny spoke to a couple of, of the key uh, issues, um, not least of which emphasis in both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. And I would add uh, the recently released, I believe last week, uh, national strategy for countering terrorism in which the word partner or partnership is mentioned 74 times. Now, I have to acknowledge that some of those partnerships are, are local law enforcement, but there's a huge emphasis, as there was in the last administration, on, on partnerships. So this is, again, not new, but it does have uh, enduring relevance. More to the point for Civic, I think, in the angle we approached this from, uh, you know, Jenny spoke to a number of the case studies, Yemen uh, first and foremost among them, but if you look at places like Syria, Iraq, Nigeria, Niger, Libya, Somalia, uh, the Philippines, where civilian harm is very much a real consideration in local conflicts, uh, where the U.S. has some role to play, some partnership role that it's playing, in some cases more significant than others, um, there are a range of policy and legal implications for the U.S. Uh, in their involvement. And therefore, and the third reason we wrote it, is our belief that the U.S. government therefore has not only the responsibility, uh, but also an opportunity and really an interest uh, in taking proactive steps to do what it can uh, to mitigate the risks that uh, are both inherent in and created by the act of partnership, uh, but also some of the risks that are, that are independent of U.S. Uh, altogether, but nonetheless carry implications for the U.S. One other quick note on, on, in just kind of a prefatory way, um, you'll note that we took a little bit of an expansive interpretation of partnered operations. And when you ask people what, what is meant by partnered operations or, um, or partnership, what that means, I think we, we intentionally took the position that the act of partnering could mean a range of things to include support, uh, the provision of intelligence or arms, um, and the range of risks that comes with a variety of different levels of significance in partnership. And of course, we also mean circumstances in which the U.S. is actively involved in hostilities with its partners. But, um, but I think the, the analysis is better, better served by a more expansive uh, interpretation. And I don't want to go into all the findings that, that Jenny mentioned, but just a couple of quick points of emphasis, perhaps. First and foremost, I don't think we should leave the conversation without at least acknowledging that the active security partnership is a political one. Um, and when we approach it from a technocratic standpoint, sometimes we can walk right past that, that reality. Um, partnership derives from interests uh, that are as political, if not more so, uh, than they're operational. And I think the consequence for that realization and the way we treat this uh, analytically is we often ask a lot of uh, the tacticians on the ground, the special forces teams, for example, um, who are out there. We, we want them to work miracles when it comes to changing uh, fundamental dynamics on the ground. Um, but they'll not be able to change, you know, any more than a humanitarian worker can um, the kind of political variables driving uh, the act of partnership and the urgency or the perceived urgency, and in some cases, uh, the manufactured sense of urgency driving uh, partnership. 
um, that can cause us to ignore troubling signals when they arise. Um, and on this issue, Jenny spoke to the, the importance of political alignment and how that, you know, variations in, in political objectives and risk perceptions uh, can affect um, risks. Um, but also sh we should understand, and I think she spoke nicely to this, the fact that, you know, the analysis of risk is not a static uh, assessment, but one that needs to be done prior, during, uh, and throughout the course of a relationship and one in which the United States government has a range of options at its disposal um, for, a, for dealing with those risks, whether that's um, you know, changing the kinds of assistance or placing additional emphasis on, on positive measures um, or developing contingencies, and in some cases, off-ramps. Um, a lot of times these discussions tend to focus on training as the solution. Um, I think we came away from the workshops with the understanding that we shouldn't abandon training as a positive option that's available and one that can be effective. Uh, but training isn't going to overcome major institutional gaps in accountability and oversight. And I'll just conclude uh, what were intended to be very brief remarks just by saying that there is some good news to this. I'm an eternal optimist uh, on some level. Um, the U.S. is really well positioned, both in terms of its capabilities and its influence, and it should underestimate neither of those things uh, when it comes to the role that it can play um, in developing and sharing leading practices. Um, but we think the best chance it has at maximizing that potential um, is to really to, to develop a kind of consistent approach across the, the federal government, uh, uniform acknowledgement of the importance of, of civilians in, in design of partnerships and partnered operations, uh, and resourcing uh, where necessary. So I'll conclude with that, but uh, really, again, grateful to CSIS and Interaction, all my partners and everybody else in the room, and uh, we'll look forward to the discussion. But thanks to our panelists. Great, thanks so much uh, to both Danny and Jan for, for the fantastic uh, overview of the, the report and our intent behind it. And I'm grateful to both of them for, for their partnership. Um, we hope to do more work together in this arena. And this is really the beginning of a conversation uh, today. Um, we've assembled a, a group of experts uh, crossing this issue, both from a policy perspective from state DOD, also from uh, keynotes of the humanitarian and international community uh, to begin to unpack this uh, with us in a public floor today, uh, but, but really hope to continue the conversation um, further on through private workshopping and stakeholder engagement, uh, field research to come. So um, we look, look forward to bringing you along on that journey with us. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our guests today. Um, we have uh, Mr. Charles Kablaha, who is the Director of the Office of the Sec Security and Human Rights in the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. From 2013 until January 2016, he was the Director of the same Bureau's Office of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Prior to that, Mr. Blaha served in the Department's International Organizations Bureau, Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs Office, and as counselor for the Political and Specialized Agency section of the US, U.S. Mission to the UN in Geneva. Uh, to my immediate right, I have Ms. Alexandra Bouven, the, is the head of the regional delegation for the United States and Canada for the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. Before assuming her position in Washington, she was chief of staff to ICRC President Peter Maror and also served as secretary to the ICRC's governing board. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Ms. Amanda Catanzano. She is the Director for International Programs Policy and Advocacy at the International Rescue Committee. Prior to that, she served as the Director of Strategic Planning for the U.S. National Security Council, where she provided strategic policy analysis and guidance to the National Security Advisor and the President. Ms. Catanzano has also served in a number of positions within the U.S. Department of State, most recent of which was in the Secretary's Policy Planning staff. Thanks, Amanda. And of course, uh, last but not least is uh, Mr. Mark Swain, who is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Stability and Humanitarian Affairs in the U.S. Department of Defense's Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Uh, Mr. Swain previously previously served as the Director for Northwest Central Africa and Horn of Africa Regional Director in OSD Policy. He <coughs> retired from the U.S. Navy in 2008 and has been working defense policy issues since January 2002. Um, so, so today, uh, you know, to, to begin to unpack these issues, we are going to focus on three core three themes, uh, the strengths and limitations of the growing reliance on U.S. partnered operations um, when it comes to operating in and among civilian populations, 
how protection of civilian issues factor into the design of security partnerships, so thinking of these issues upstream. Um, and then also the incentives, punitive measures, and off-ramps uh, that can be used at the policy and pr practitioner level with security partners to improve the protection of civilians in, in partnered operations. Um, we're going to try to structure this conversation actually as a conversation uh, rather than having set panel remarks uh, because there's a lot of expertise here on the stage and I, I'd love to, to engage everyone in a, in a relatively free-flowing conversation um, and encourage all of our speakers where possible to pepper in some specific uh, con contextual country examples to help us illuminate some of these issues that tend to, to be a little arcane or, or technocratic when we start uh, talking about uh, particular levers. Um, but perhaps to, to kick things off, if I could turn to, to Cobb first, um, at least as the way that uh, we approached in, in our report and as we conceptualized the, this issue, we think of partnered operations more broadly, security cooperation fundamentally as a political act, as Dan uh, mentioned, uh, as an act of U.S. foreign policy. How does the Department of State view the overarching purpose of security partnership um, relative to other means of advancing foreign policy goals and evaluate the relative costs and benefits when, when it comes to mitigating civilian harm? Sure. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank um, Civic Interaction and CSIS for doing this. This is, a, the, um, as, as everyone has laid out, um, partnered operations are a fact of life. And partnered operations are a very good thing. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about some of the issues and some of the problems, and that's good, and we should do that. Um, but let's remember who's on the other side. Who's on the other side is ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and Abu Sayyaf. And if we think about who is causing um, the greatest amount of human suffering, um, it's, it's a lot of those organizations. Um, and so um, partnered operations are here to stay, and they should be. Uh, to answer your question, Melissa, uh, you know, for, for the State Department, um, partnered operations are they're one tool in the toolbox. So we've got lots of tools in the toolbox. We've got military assistance, so a lot of times when we're talking about uh, partnered operations, it falls under that rubric. We have economic assistance. We have um, public diplomacy, which is a tool. We have, you know, economic and cultural affairs um, types of initiatives that are, that are another tool of advancing U.S. interests. Now, all of these, um, all of these things, you know, are, are designed ultimately to protect the interests of the United States, to keep people safe. Um, but keeping people safe um, is more um, than just responding to direct military threats or, direct, uh, or, or other kinds of threats. It's making sure that those kinds of threats um, never materialize. Uh, the strengths um, of partnered operations, I, I guess, um, like Dan, I'm an optimist about them, um, but to paraphrase Madeleine Albright, I'm an optimist who worries a lot. Um, and uh, one of the great advantages of partner operations, obviously, um, fewer U.S. boots on the ground. The lead is by, by local forces who hopefully have um, a better sense of the culture and the geography and the language and all those types of things. Um, we can provide resources and niche capabilities that um, that foreign forces, the partner forces may not have. We can provide mentoring. Now, like Dan said, there, there, and training, maybe there are some limitations to that. We can talk about that. Um, there are limitations and risks. We'll get into those today. Um, and the report um, lays them out. Um, obviously, there are limitations to U.S. operational control. Um, and there, and, and again, this is something we may talk about today, um, foreign partners may be reluctant to, um, to accept um, more U.S. operational control or U.S. advice. Um, and there's always the risk, and, and we've seen this more and more, um, that uh, part, when, when we partner with foreign forces, that we, the United States, will get blamed um, for failures in civilian protection um, by foreign forces. It, it'll, it, it can make us unpopular with the local population. It can hurt our relations with allies, it can erode domestic support. So um, that's sort of a, a brief overview the way I see it. Great. Thanks so much, Cab. Amanda, I'd like to turn to, to you next um, to bring in a, um, 
humanitarian implementer perspective, uh, what is the experience of civilians in armed conflict broadly? Um, and what are the types of problems occurring in the context of security partnerships that need to be addressed? Okay. Thank you, Melissa. And again, just to, to echo Cop, I want to thank CSIS and Civic and, and Interaction for, for bringing this all together. Um, I've been part of those working groups and those discussions, as Dan and Jenny um, indicated, were really fruitful, and I see it reflected in the report. So thank you for having us today. Um, and thank you for letting a humanitarian have a bit of a role in this conversation. Um, I think you know I, a lot of, of what Jenny and Dan have spoken about in terms of, of unpacking what civilian harm means. Um, I don't want to minimize or sort of or paper over the, the question of civilian casualties because it's of course going to be a dominant part of this report and a dominant part of this conversation today. Um, but I think it really is um, a tip of the iceberg in terms of civilian harm and the impact of armed conflict um, on civilians. Um, an organization like the IRC, we, we, we um, respond almost exclusively at this point to conflict-affected populations. Um, the, the crises that we um, respond to are man-made and driven by conflict. Um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, um, it was about 80% natural disaster and 20% conflict. It's now that that figure has flipped where we're responding to 80% conflict-driven humanitarian crises versus natural disasters. And I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind because it really does dictate humanitarian response, really does dictate humanitarian suffering. A lot of that civilian harm, like Cobb said, is often not at the hands of the US or the US, you know, most often not at the hands of the US or US security partners. Um, but I don't think that um, we should also you know, wish away where it does have some harm. And some of the most complex um, emergency, uh, humanitarian emergencies to which we're responding are places where US or US partnered uh, partners are um, our parties to the conflict, whether that's um, Yemen, which is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world that Jenny laid out, um, but also Northeast Nigeria and Iraq and Northeast Nigeria. And there's a civilian harm being done um, on all sides. But what does that civilian harm look like? Yes, it's civilian casualties, but it's also, like Jenny mentioned, um, infrastructure damage, which in some ways, despite the sort of headline-grabbing nature of a catastrophic airstrike that might kill 40 kids on a school bus in Yemen, what often doesn't get caught in the headlines is um, a water sanitation facility that gets knocked offline. It's part of driving the largest cholera outbreak in history in, in Yemen, and that's a lasting impact. Or the fact that half of the medical facilities have been knocked offline means that a minor illness or injury can result in life threatening. And so sometimes those civilian casualty numbers don't necessarily capture the impact that it's having on the civilian um, population from these secondary and tertiary impacts. Um, but it's also a question of not just the kinetic impact on civilians, but the non-kinetic impacts as well, and where they experience it, which is not just in that moment of conflict. It's not just when the airstrike happens, or just from um, a, a water facility being knocked offline, or just in the physical location of a conflict. It's, um, you know, it's in their um, flight from a conflict, when a safe route hasn't been communicated or a safe route hasn't been identified, as was the case out of, of Mosul. Um, first they were told to stay in shelter in place, then they were told to, to evacuate, and it, it led to an, a displacement of 900,000 people. It's in that flight, it's in the screening centers and that they hit on their, their way to safety, where there's not necessarily due process, where there, isn't, where there are partner forces who haven't been trained or don't understand how to communicate um, the, the procedures that are happening and there's uncertainty. Um, and then there's in displacement itself, which Jenny said isn't, isn't temporary, despite the fact that much humanitarian response is set up to, re to, to respond to temporary displacements. They last, as Jenny said, 17 years and what happens to them in displacement, lack of access to services, lack of freedom of movement. <coughs> Um, and then even when there is um, a return home, when there is large-scale destruction, what, what kind of impact does that have on education, on livelihoods, on, on a building a future for your family? So it's not just a civilian casualty, and it's not just in a moment. It's sort of the long-term impacts that the, that the populations we seek to serve have to endure over that time. So we can unpack that even more, but I think I can leave it there for now. Thanks. That's, that's a really great uh, overview. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll come back to a number of those, those points. Um, Yemen has inevitably uh, come up a couple times already in, in the conversation. Um, and just yesterday, General Votel, in a, a public interview, noted that it's better to stay engaged uh, with, with Saudi Arabia and its current operations in Yemen um, than, than to walk away. Um, Mark, t turning to you next, uh, broadly speaking, but, but building from that, what proactive or preventative steps uh, can DOD take in shaping state and non-state actor behavior to mitigate civilian harm? Are there specific 
types of, of training or approaches <coughs> to exercises as well as uh, in the conduct of current operations that have worked well uh, for, for the department um, in existing or, or prior partnerships? Absolutely. And again, I'd like to thank you all for inviting us here today. And, uh, and I <coughs> appreciate reading the report and look forward to having continued discussion. And I think uh, in a democracy, it's always great when uh, you work that uh, government and non-governmental organizations work together to say, hey, let's, let's examine an issue and let's see if there's a way we can do things better. And I think this is an opportunity for us uh, to think about this more broadly. Getting back to your question, um, <coughs> and specifically, when the United States military works throughout the world in lots of places, sometimes we're a member of a coalition. If we're a member of a coalition, that is a clear command and control structure and we are all operating under the same rules of engagement and we are many countries, state co actors working together and it have a clear chain of command and we obviously work through uh, everything that we can do to uh, make sure that we are complying with international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict. When you talk about partnered nations, and that's, that's where it gets a little bit more difficult because sometimes it might be a state actor, it might be a non-state actor that we are working with. Sometimes we have the same goal, that we want to defeat some organization uh, militarily, but yet we don't have control, and a lot of times when we work with a non-state actor, we don't have control over their, their structure, their, their uh, civilian or military lead. So it's more difficult that we do not have maybe the exact same rules of engagement, but we certainly don't uh, lessen our rules of engagement. We don't lessen the, the objectives and the norms that we work on every day. And by setting the example, by working with those partners, um, that's one way that we can show that we, we set kind of the, the highest standard. If you have another country that, that set, does a better standard, we're all ears because we, we want to absolutely be the best. Because not only for protection of civilians and civilian casualties, when you look at it, it's the right thing to do. But from a military perspective, you are not better as a military if there are civilians in harm's way. If we're protecting civilians, we're avoiding civilian casualties, we are more effective as a military operating force. So there's multiple reasons why uh, that makes good sense. But going back to working with the non-state actors and those partners, sometimes those partners are operating in their own country or an area where they didn't ask us if we thought that was a good idea that they should <coughs> deal with this, what they perceive as a national security threat. So if they're taking operations and military activities, we're not always sanctioning everything they're doing. We're not sitting in their war room figuring out what the target list is. But if we are, can operate and advise and assist and provide the best, best military advice to be more effective, I think that's where we have some strengths. And besides, uh, you asked a question about how can we be more effective, some of it starts with that first relationship. Some of those things, some of those security cooperation tools that we have, again, most of the tools that we have from the United States military, many of those authorities really reside with the State Department and, and we work closely with State. There's the Title 22 authorities that says, can we send someone to Army War College or National War College? That's actually under a State Department authority, International uh, Military Education and Training, IMET, and DOD implements it. So w even when we send somebody to a school, we have to, as we say, Leahy vet them because of Senator Leahy, the law for uh, human rights vetting. We don't want to train a known violator of gross violation of human rights. So even when we start those basic interactions, we, we start with uh, fundamental human rights policies and then any of our security assistance that we work with any country uh, that is also incorporated in everything we do. Some of the quick examples that we have is GPOI, Global Peace Operations Initiative. Again, another program run by the State Department specifically designed of how we work with partners in the peacekeeping environment, but one in which every time we train a foreign military to go to a peacekeeping operation, and again, the DOD implements uh, state's program, the combat, our combatant commands do that. Uh, we do that with uh, 
the human rights and uh, all the vetting that goes re required with that. We also have the Defense Institute for International Legal Studies, DILS, and they're the organization in Newport, Rhode Island that, that works with that. So fundamentally from when we start a relationship with another country to when we get more advanced conducting coalition uh, operations, uh, these tenants are inherent in everything we do. Thanks, Mark. Um, turning to, to Alex, certainly not least, uh, what is the experience of, of civilians, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what are the risks and concerns for civilian protection um, in the viewpoint of ICRC, observing in relation to partnered operations and, and perhaps more broadly for coalition operations? And I should note um, the considerable work that, that ICRC has done uh, surrounding this issue, including its publication, The Roots and Restraint of War. So please, Alex. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I think that uh, Amanda and Jenny did a really good job at uh, providing the backdrop against which we're having this conversation, which really, as everyone has said, is not about saying whether partnered operations aggravate or reduce um, civilian harm. It's more about understanding the context within which these, uh, this trend towards more partnering is taking place. Um, I would just li like to add perhaps a little bit of an observation as a frontline organization in terms of our environment and how it's being affected by the proliferation of internal armed conflicts. So we're noting, I think it's doubling the number of, arm of internal armed conflicts since 2001. And here we're looking with that at the proliferation of armed groups. And on the proliferation of armed groups, to be realistic about what that means, um, we note that about more than 20% of these internal armed conflicts today involve more than 10 groups. So that, that's, the, that's the environment in which we're operating, and I think we have to bear that in mind. Um, in the last six years, and I'll stop with the statistics, but I think these numbers are important, we've noted that there's been more armed groups uh, coming up or developing than in the past six decades. So. That proliferation of actors with the fact, combined with the fact that uh, international organizations like ours that seek acceptance from all sides need to be able to intersect with all of those mm -hmm. actors creates for a particular predicament and a, a, a high complexity of, 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 of the battlefield. So um, I would say our, you know, we, cannot, we can agree or not agree on whether partnered operations are adding more weapons or adding more groups to, 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 to the to the reality, but I think where we do all agree is that um, the gap that you talked about, Jenny, I think we could characterize as a shadow, a shadow in which this civilian suffering seems to find itself. And part of what we're trying to do here is how can we lift that shadow? It's not that in, in other types of military operations there isn't uh, invisibility of, of, of civilian harm and suffering, but there's more of a risk of that suffering going unseen of the of, of the lack of redress or recognition of what's really happening to civilians that are caught up in armed conflict today. Um, I've combined with that, I would point to the, the, the lack of, of clear legal frameworks, meaning that you have this pat, patchwork of international agreements and domestic regulation that come into play when you're looking at partnered operations, um, and you have a lack of clear lines of responsibility in some of these arrangements, security cooperation arra arrangements. The reality is that there's a deliberate decision not to be proximate, right? So the lack of proximity, which doesn't give you the oversight and control that, that, that is so, so necessary, are all realities that we have to contend with. Um, so the, the, the difficulties that I've just laid out with the, the, the lack of transparency that we feel on the outside sometimes in terms of understanding how these partnerships are developed and how they operate, what motivates them, and combining that lack of transparency with all of this complexity means that people do look away. There really is a sense of it's too complicated and how can we really address this issue. Um, so, which is why a conversation like this is so critical because it helps us to understand all of these different factors that pull and push towards more cooperation and at the same time uh, creates a space for us to be able to express our concerns based on, on the ground truth that, that we represent. Um, the approach that we've taken as an or organization, as ICRC, after much reflection, is to emphasize the opportunity. 
And we're very deliberate in this, and I think it shows, it speaks to our pragmatism, but it's essentially to say, states who are partnering and supporting have tremendous influence, and we want to be able to leverage that influence to incentivize good behavior. And that is the direction that we're taking today. That doesn't mean that we're not equally at the same time fully, completely engaged with those who are carrying the weapons and trying to get them to change their behavior. But we find that it's important that we accompany that with a, with a discussion and an engagement of the states that are supporting and making that behavior happen. If I may, a few, a few words about the Roots of Restraint study that came out this year. It's an important um, study for us and it's, uh, it, it, it looks at uh, the behavior of states and non-state armed groups to try and understand not why they violate international humanitarian law, but why they choose to exercise restraint. And, what we and, what, and, and, and in doing so, we were pursuing two objectives. On the one hand, we were interested in looking critically at what has been our way of approaching vertically structured conventional armed forces for the last 15, 20 years. And at, on the other hand, we also wanted to explore some uncharted territory, which is how do you influence the behavior of these very loosely organized armed groups? And we found um, a couple of interesting things. And because today, although I fully uh, agree that there are limitations to the value of training, and it's important that we be cognizant about the limits of training as a way to ensure compliance, uh, there is also, I think for all of us, a recognition that training in the law is important. So what this study helped us give uh, insight, this study gave us some insights through some findings um, on, on what might work. One of them is the importance of understanding the organizational structure of the, work, of the group that we're working with. And so looking at the more loosely organized a group will be, the more it will be influenced by political, spiritual, cultural uh, elements n rather than the um, chain of command, as it were. So understanding that these more loosely organized groups that we may be partnering with are not necessarily going to be responsive to what we're used to, which is a top-down <coughs> approach. Um, and, th and that leads to another, actually, finding, it, which is about the importance of the community. Now, in some cases, we see communities that are encouraging hateful behavior, dehumanizing discourse. But by and large, we also found that many communities will be impactful in terms of encouraging behavior that is more on the side of restraint. I think Colombia was one of the examples that was well documented in the study. Uh, showing that, you know, in one case, the fact that pipelines were not attacked was because a group of co conservationists had actually con con convinced the fighters not to attack them. It's not the, the typical group you would go to. It's not the church leader. It's not the community leader. It's a group that had some influence in that community, so to be recognized. Another, another couple findings that are interesting, the quality of the training. We all know that the PowerPoint checklist training doesn't work. But this study provides a little bit more insight about the importance of doing the training on the ground and actually putting people and soldiers in the duress environment that they are going to have to operate in, um, hungry and scared and fearful, and that that is where the learning is most likely to happen. So that's the what, but there's a who as well. And observing that for some, having their peers speak to them was most effective, whereas for others, it was having someone of a completely different rank. These things are very different and very specific. So I think the point is here that there is some investment to be made in knowing your partner. And beyond, so I understand the point of, you know, do they comply with a specific requirement that makes them eligible to go to a specific class? But beyond that, if we're talking about influence, which is such a fuzzy big space, having, um, yeah, having the, the drive and the momentum to go further down to really, really dig down and understand what, where, where those uh, sources of influence lie. Thanks so much. A lot packed in there. Um, I, I'd love to, to pick up on this idea of transparency and then also mapping the environment and, and the partner because I think there's an important conversation to be had on that issue that is DC based in terms of how from a policy level we're designing partnerships but also what ought to be the conversations that are happening in, in the field um, between and amongst humanitarian implementers, um, local embassy, local military actors that are executing these, these programs and, and policy. I'd love for any one of you to jump in on what you think the current state of uh, those communications in a relationships level of transparency is. 
uh, both within Washington as well as perhaps even more critically in the field in um, mapping out what the environment is, what the incentive structures are for local partners, and where we best can collectively exercise mm -hmm. some, some leverage on their choices. If anybody wants to jump in on that. I can start with a yep. few challenges, I think, from a yep. field level perspective. I mean, I actually think this is an example of how these conversations do happen mm -hmm. in DC. And I think that, you know, I would say that my, my USG colleagues' doors are open to have these mm -hmm. conversations, and they may not always be pleasant, and they may not always be telling each other what we want to hear. But I think there is a decent amount mm -hmm. of coordination that can happen, and, and things that force that coordination to happen in DC. But it's such an incomplete yeah. part of this, because I think when we just like, I think there's an analogy with what Alex said about how training in a pristine classroom versus training hungry, scared, tired, I think there's coordination that can happen in DC that isn't necessarily very meaningful at the field level where things are confused and things are happening fast yeah. and there's mismatches mm -hmm. in the kinds of people who need to have those conversations. Um, a person who's working for an NGO in DC, like myself, comes from the US government, understands how to have conversations, understands where you plug in. The typical humanitarian field worker and the typical person who is engaging in the field in the military perspective, they don't have those same relationships. They don't speak the same language. There's um, kind of there's a ton of information that each other needs from one another, but they don't even know that the other person has it. And you know, there's there's um, a different language. There's a, yeah. a, a, I think there's you know a, not a culture within the NGO community where where they're, they're really living their principles, that where they feel necessarily comfortable being seen reaching out to, to the military, um, especially when the channels of doing so aren't clear and they're afraid of what it looks like to the populations they're trying to serve when they're trying to be impartial and independent in how they operate. I think those principles are confounding sometimes to, to um, the military and to our partner forces in terms of why are you talking to these actors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is, you know, there's some distrust. There's just a difference in the way we talk in terms of what access means, access to and just mean being able to sort of drop food in a place where it's needed, but it's about the ability to deliver services and to, to be able to offer me uh, medical care and mental um, health services. And there, so there's a mismatch in the communication and the way we talk. And also when there is a channel um, that is identified, I think one example is around SDF in Northeast Syria, and there was sort of a, a, a portal that was designed to allow the NGO community to kind of plug in and share data when they were seeing things that made them uncomfortable or seeing potential violations on the part of the SDF. It kind of went into a black box. They didn't hear a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it was because there's a difference in a definition of what's actionable and what's specific enough to be taken seriously. And I think that um, conflicts with, with uh, humanitarians' desire to, to protect their clients, mm -hmm. to be really careful about information you share that might lead to retaliation against a client. So anything that's too specific in, in name, a date, a place, a particular camp yeah. is not something that a humanitarian is comfortable sharing, mm -hmm. and we sort of want to have the, the courtesy extended to us that if we're raising an issue, that it, it should be taken <coughs> seriously without that kind of personal, identifiable information. So I think we, ha we haven't been able to replicate at the field level where things are much messier and move much faster, the, the sort of common language. And we're still not entirely common in our language in DC, but we haven't been able to replicate that. And so I think yeah. part of it is individual NGOs looking to OCHA or to, to UN agencies or to their humanitarian country team to be that spokesperson, but they don't even necessarily have the right plugins there to share the information and make sure that the HCT um, or o OCHA in their civil capacity is passing that information. Yeah. So I just think its first steps have been identified. I don't want to um, discourage something like the portal in Northeast Syria by saying it wasn't perfect because it was certainly a start and, and it was something that didn't exist before, but it is an example of how these things have to be sort of thought through and thought through from the beginning rather than sort of midstream. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think one illuminating um, best practice that, that we uncovered through our workshopping process in that navigating that tension between the humanitarian's imperatives to um, keep the confidentiality mm -hmm. Um, of, of the civilians that they're trying to enable, um, but then you know the, the need on the military security and to to redress uh, some of some of that conduct was rather than naming specific units to at least identify the relative geographic area in which the the issue popped up, such that um, that could be identified through military channels in terms of what units are actually operating in that area. So I think there's a way to. Uh, weave that, that thread in a way that protects the humanitarian pr prerogatives that we don't want to um, obviously undermine, but at the same time enable uh, 
uh, military and uh, um, the security elements to actually address the, the conduct in specific units or with specific individuals. So um, for, for us in the State Department, um, our prim the primary people we look to in the first instance are um, our country team, our embassy. Yep. So any request for assistance <laughs> comes to us um, from our embassy, the chief of mission, the ambassador, has to approve it. Um, if, it's a, if it's a request for assistance to the military, um, it would come from the, the defense attache, and of course a lot of that originates in the combatant command, but the, but the channel is through our embassy. But remember, there are, um, you know, there are lots of eyes and ears in the embassy, so every embassy has a human rights officer. Uh, the human rights officer is, uh, is their, their job is to maintain contact with, with local NGOs um, and to uh, have a very full understanding of the human rights problems and the human rights issues. And um, it, the, uh, the other sections of the embassy, too, are supposed to be aware of that. So, for example, we do get human rights reporting from our defense attaches. That happens. That's one of our most um, valuable sources. We get it from our political sections. We get it um, through the media, um, through media reports. We get it um, through, uh, through other channels, too. Um, and, but a lot of that originates in the embassies. Um, we rely very heavily on, on local NGOs. And I, I take the point, Amanda, that a lot of times um, it's difficult for a local NGO to go um, to go to the, to the U.S. Embassy and be identified uh, with it. And in terms of specificity of reports, I take the point. But, um, for example, um, if we want to um, enforce the Leahy Law, the way the law is written is we have to have information on specific units. It's not enough to say, well, you know, this, you know, this division is committing human rights abuses. We need, we need more specifics than that. Um, we can still you know, as a, as a matter of policy, if we, you know, if we get enough reports, uh, it's, it's possible that we'd make a policy decision not to work. Mm -hmm. But if, if we want to, um, to implement the Leahy Law, which is, which is one of the, of the, uh, of, the care of, of the sticks, one of the disincentives, one of the off-ramps, we have to have specific information. Uh, and one of the things that, um, that I'm always asking um, our programming people to do is to train um, civilians and investigative journalists on, on how to do this type of stuff. But, but yeah, there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. um, the tension is that if, you know, if a report gets identified with an individual or with a community, there could be retaliation. So um, yep. that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a tension that's inherent there. Yeah. Cup, you, you've raised the, the, the off-ramp um, question, you, and I feel like this is um, one of those elusive policy questions that, um, you know, we often have to, to grapple with. And be curious both from, from Cop's perspective and Mark's perspective, and then also, you know, Amanda and, and Alex, please feel free to, to weigh in in terms of what, what is the best way to kind of structure the, the process process and also policy criteria necessary to make a determination of when we need to off-ramp uh, a security partnership because certain violations have occurred. There's, I mean, there's Leahy, there's what the law says, well, there's IHL, but there's that squishy policy I, middle ground. I'd be interested in Mark's answer. What, what I would say is... Me too. This, <laughs> but this, this is the recurring dilemma that those of us in government face and those of you who in this room who have been in government know. Uh, we can, there are times when an off-ramp or cutting off a relationship, cutting off assistance, withholding some benefits, will send the right signal, be the right thing to do, um, will save us some of those reputational risks. But we have to weigh that um, against um, the possibility that, that we'll have diminished influence. And this is the eternal dialogue that, and the eternal dilemma that we, that those of us who deal with these things on any level, um, have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mark, did you, you know, completely agree. The, uh, when it's <clears throat> black and white what the law is, what the law is not, we certainly comply with the law. That's easy when it's that grayer area, larger issue. Um, 
<clears throat> whenever you're working with uh, a partner, uh, usually you have the same goal. Hopefully you have the same goal or maybe you shouldn't be working with that partner. And it, when you have uh, that goal with that partner and you're trying to work with them, I think it goes back to when you're working with them in a uh, environment, what you can say publicly and what you can't say publicly, what you can say privately. And when you have those gray areas, uh, you have to have really frank discussions and hard discussions with them uh, privately that you probably are not going to go out and say it in front of a panel and tell everybody uh, what you're saying or what you're doing but you those conversations happen and they happen on the diplomatic side they happen on the mill to mill side uh, with our military partners and uh, and then it's that those senior leaders have to make that determination when is it uh, when is it gone too far or when is it when do we hit an area where we, we can't correct or we need to make it we have, we have to pull back from that relationship so um, I think engagement in general, if we're working with a partner from a mill-to-mill -mill side, is, is better because when we disengage from a partner military, I usually don't see them uh, raising the level of norms and, and providing uh, you know, higher quality of uh, international standards and, and protecting civilians, and that's what we're here to talk about today, you know, protection. And I think when, when we remain engaged as a country and as a military, uh, we are always uh, more effective from what I can see. Are we always perfect? No, we are not, but uh, I have yet to run into a diplomat or a military member in the United States government who is like, yeah, I just don't care about that. I mean, people want to get a good result, and the whole reason we're engaging with that country in whatever scenario it is, is to make things better for those people who are on the ground. and. Uh, so I think that's, that's the ultimate goal, but that is the, the really tough, tough question. Yeah. Alex, you want to judge a bit on this? Yes. I <laughs> <laughs> have some no, I, I, I'm smiling because I feel like I'm hearing our own discourse when people say, well, when are you going to denounce this right. violation? When are you yeah. going to leave this country? And I, the analogy yeah. has its limits. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I do, I, I understand the decision that we make as an institution to keep the door open, to keep it open for engagement and, to, and, 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 and because we know that when we leave as a humanitarian once again, it'll take years to rebuild the trust and have the access to be able to make a difference to people on the ground. So from a humanitarian perspective, the logic makes sense to me. Now I can see some limits to the military analogy in the sense that, especially when it comes to providing equipment, which can enable um, certain hostilities to continue. That being said, I am, because the position is to stay engaged, I, I, I wonder whether the effort doesn't then need to go more to investigating the incentives so the carrots rather than the sticks. And it, mm -hmm. so, you know, very interested in, in hearing about the work that's being done to comply with the requirements of the Lehi law and to, to um, train journalists and others in doing their reporting adequately to identify the violator, but much more interested in when do you come and sit with us to find out what makes these people tick? I mean, that's the conversation that we're not having, but that might be useful, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the roots of behavior, roots of restraint study, is to say we need maybe to have these conversations. Of, and I think we made these recommendations in the con with, to NATO in the context of the Lessons Learned report we did on ISAF, and we, we looked at being able to inform the military of certain um, certain cultural realities that they were not attuned to and that was thwarting certain decisions and creating more harm than was necessary. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just us, international organization, it's locals, local members of society, civilians, community leaders who can help understand what is going to help make this group comply as opposed to, not as opposed to, I understand it's also important to properly document misbehavior, but I think we may be overly emphasizing the need to document the violations in order to draw that line of accountability and decide when you withdraw, when in fact we're in something much more complex and mm -hmm. fluid, where what we need to do is enlarge the pie and make sure that there's more opportunities for groups to comply. I say groups, I mean states, groups, mm -hmm. actors. 
Yeah. Well, and you know, there are also questions of do we have the right tools to um, apply to not just state-based partnerships, but also non-state-based partnerships. There are limits to late yes. because we also because, have non-state yes. partnerships. Yes. Very good point. Amanda, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the way I would look at it, I don't think I, don't, I think there's a lot more agreement than there is disagreement in the terms of the value of engagement. And 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 you know, I think both from my time in government and my time in the humanitarian world, I, I don't disagree with that. And so I think maybe a, a way to think about it is is to flip the question about off ramps on its head to the question of on ramps and the question of what are you doing at the beginning? Yeah. Because yes. red lines yes. are really hard outside yes. of the very specific law, but when we're in the squishy or gray area, yep. as it's yep. been described, red lines are really hard to to um, to announce and enforce yeah. retroactively, and so I think what what's going in at the front end of this yeah. of, of these yes. partnerships in terms of your due diligence on what the capacities are, not making assumptions, not draw you know not um, treating each partnership differently and, and based on its capacity. Um, thinking about what we bring to the table in terms of of, of training and, and 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 operational support. And, and what our expectations are, being clear about them yes. privately, but when necessary publicly. I think there are some partners that we have that respond better to some public um, notion of this. I mean, I think, you know, I don't want to overextend the Yemen example, but I think we've seen better behavior from the Saudi led coalition when they have received some, some sort of public um, condemnation of their behavior from the administration, both this one and the previous one. Um, yep. And so I wouldn't underestimate, you know, public diplomacy as well as private diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, Thinking about it beyond just what it means to support them in combat. What does it mean to support? And this is, you know, a big role for the State Department and for the ambassadors in terms of what is what does the institutional support look like? What are you doing for mechanisms for accountability and enforcing their own laws of when these violations occur? Yes. How are you making it more than just about this operation or this particular moment in combat? Mm -hmm. But how are you building that capacity and how mm -hmm. are you outlining that from the beginning so that it's clear what the expectations are? Because yep. I think a lot of that does go unsaid. I think there's a lot of good practice within the United States military on how this happens and therefore they can bring if that systematized throughout its own practice it can be brought to bear at the beginning of these relationships and mm -hmm. so I, I would I would definitely focus more on the front end than the back end yeah. because it, it's really easy to justify something when you're starting to go to, when you've already gone down the road but I think at the start being more uniform and more deliberate is where you can get at some of these of uh, these issues yeah no I would love to get um, both uh, Cobb and, and Mark's thoughts on on the front-end design of these partnerships and then we're gonna uh, turn to, to Q&A from the the audience um, which I'll moderate but um, to, to Cobb and Mark you know in, we've talked about training we've talked about the importance of exercises that are scenario based that really uh, test uh, the, the mental resolve and, and physical stamina of, of our partner forces. What are the other tool sets or, or criteria that we ought to be thinking about at the front end? Um, you know, there's that question of mapping the, the environment in which these forces are operating. There's the incentive structures that, that drive these forces. What are the other things that we should be thinking about? And how is that balanced against the hard policy and operational realities of some of these partnerships that drive us to oftentimes use security partnerships as a short-term uh, response mechanism in, in crisis? Um, ISIS invades uh, Mosul, you know, sweeps into to parts of Syria and Iraq. Um, you know, we have to mobilize quickly with our, our Kurdish uh, partners, just as an example, and then later on are playing catch up in terms of, of addressing some of these concerns. You want to go first? Do you want me to? <laughs> Does, uh, <clears throat> when you start out with a, uh, a new crisis, uh, usually it's, you can kind of see it building and then uh, there's always options. When you work in policy, you have to give your policy makers options and you can come up with those options of either saying, Let's, this should be a coalition, we should lead this. And there's uh, many times in the last, I can think of, of times where you know, the United States uh, citizens don't want the United States military to lead everything. It's like, do we have to lead everything? Do we, you want the military to lead this or, or be involved in this operation? So there are always policy decisions that or recommendations to the policy deciders that say, do we take the lead? You know, this is a U.S.-led coalition or this is a, a scenario where this country is dealing with a, a, a common enemy, a common uh, but they want to be in the lead, so we, we can't take the lead. They're a sovereign nation, and we just can't come in there. So, uh, and they don't want a coalition, so they want a partner. So it's, 
every scenario is different, so it's, it's hard to come up with one size fits all answer to that question, but it's a really good question because, as, as you said, getting into the, the front end, it really helps determine the relationship between all of the military uh, actors in the in the area, and it was you know pointed out in, in the paper uh, that you all did, and I think that there's something that we need to go back and, and sit about, sit or, s sit down and think about mm -hmm. to consider are there ways to uh, add that to the policy making decision in that, okay, if we're involved in a coalition or if we're involved in this partnership that we're helping, what's the level of extent? How, what's the risk that we're going to take as a military, as mm -hmm. a government, being involved in this partnership? Maybe maybe it's not worth it. Maybe we shouldn't shouldn't do it. Again, it goes back to the the, the paradigm of if this country, who is a friend and of the United States, is involved in an operation, um, should we turn our backs on them and do nothing, or should we get as helpful as a partner should be to help? And uh, but these are excellent questions that I think, as policy uh, folks, that we need to tee up when we're decide making those options for for our bosses. I I really appreciated, Alex, your comments on, um, on figuring out, as you put it, what makes people tick. Um, I think that's really important, and uh, the comments on accountability. You know, um, Melissa, you, you emailed me last week. One of the questions you said is, you know, if, if there is one single thing that would be the most important, what would it be? Well, for me, it would be accountability. Um, accountability for, for violations. Um, that's, I think, the single thing that can really torque things around. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think it may, I'm pretty sure it's still in the report. Um, there may be um, a lot more, folk, there will be a lot more focus now, I think, in our security partnerships on some of this front end stuff. One of the, um, I, I would encourage everybody, um, I, I, I'm guessing a lot, of, a lot of people here are familiar with it, to look at Section 1209 of the current NDAA. Um, we talked about um, transparency, and one of the things um, that 1209 mandates is that, um, the, the, that state and defense cooperate on um, figuring out ways um, that there can be enhanced investigatory, I'm reading from it now, and accountability standards, um, and, uh, and efforts to create, and this is something we touched on and we can go into some more, efforts to increase partner transparency which may in, uh, include the establishment of capabilities within partner militaries to improve communication with the public. And that goes to your point, Alexandra, um, Alex, that, um, that you know, figuring out what makes different communities tick, um, figuring out what their complaints are, you know, them talking to the military, figuring out what problems the military is, um, sol what, what problems the military is trying to solve, and having the military listen to um, some of the criticisms from these communities. That's front end stuff. Mm -hmm. if, if communities um, are in, uh, in discussion with, with partner nation militaries, that helps move the ball. Um, so, and, and, I, and 1209 um, is going to, uh, encourages um, us in our efforts to build the capacities of partner militaries to, to improve, to build their capacity to have communications with the public. That's, that's front end, it's, it's making the problem, you know, it, it's figuring out what makes people tick, like you said, mm -hmm. um, and it, hopefully it can, uh, it can lead to resolution of problems before, before they occur. And then accountability, that's front end too, because what does that require? Well, that requires um, uh, building institutions, not just physical courthouses and, and prosecutors and all that jazz, that's important, but also um, creating a culture working to help foreign militaries create a culture, and this is really hard, um, where uh, those that where the uh, uh, failures and protections of civilians are not um, are not permitted, and it and having it come from the top down, from the generals and the and the defense ministers, but also having it reinforced at the bottoms, with the at the bottom with the noncoms, with the sergeants and the corporals who are who are in command in the field. Um, and again, so being, you know, being an optimist, I'm optimistic that, um, that 1209 will help us point our efforts in the right direction, make them more front end, um, make them more figuring out you know, what makes these things tick. Um, again, you know, there are limits. Um, we all know that. Um, 
partner political will is, is, is a big one. Um, and I know that I've seen the report touches on that. Um, but um, I think we've at least got a framework that, that gives us some guidance about some of the front end things we need to do. Thanks so much uh, to, to all of you. At this point, I'd love to invite the audience uh, into the conversation. Um, we do have CSIS staff on hand with microphones. Um, I will call on you if you'd please raise your hand uh, and begin uh, your question uh, with your name and affiliation and then actually form your question in the form of a question. Um, so we'll start with the uh, lady here in the front. Well, thank you. This is enormously illuminating. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. We work in peace building and conflict resolution. Some of the work that goes on in the US Department of Defense is quite opaque to those of us who are not part of it. <clears throat> and I'm really curious about the training and incorporation of foreign, foreign military folks in our war colleges, in West Point, in the Naval Academy, and so on. And conversely, sending our folks to foreign militaries and exploring their best practices. I'd be very curious to hear what we are learning on some of these issues from some of our allies. And <clears throat> one last thing, this strikes me almost as the stuff of novels. If we look at the current political leadership or soon to be political leadership of say Brazil, or say currently the <coughs> Philippines, um, the top bananas have different views of the use of protection, of the use of force. And it certainly would be a challenge to our forces to be in dialogue with people who have to report to these commanders in chief. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with the uh, thank you for the question. And, and yeah, there, uh, we have a whole host of, uh, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but all of our, our service academies, uh, so West Point, Annapolis, Air Force Academy, uh, and also our senior service academies. So <clears throat> when, a, when a military officer, when he or she is at uh, you know, the 10-year mark or the 15- to 18-year mark, they go to different levels of uh, training and uh, right over here in uh, Washington at uh, National Defense University is one of them and the Army War College, Navy and Air Force War College. And we have exchange programs and there's other countries that are regular every year. They have a slot in one of those and some of them <coughs> rotate and we do the same thing. We have re reciprocity so we have U.S. military officers men and women who go to different countries get language training and they for one year study in uh, the foreign militaries so it, it's, it's a way for us to share uh, best practices and uh, uh, a whole host throughout the world i mean it's uh, on all the continents that uh, different members of the military uh, come back and i think what is interesting most of my background was working on the african continent and it would be surprising if how many times i would be in an african country and uh, meet some colonel or someone that would say, oh, "Yes, I, you know, I trained at uh, at West Point, or I trained in in Birmingham, Alabama," and they're very proud of that fact, and uh, it just uh, creates cooperation. So, and, and what are some of the best practices we're learning from overseas militaries? Yeah, we <clears throat> we learn a ton about uh, all the time because we always have our our U.S. Uh, centric. Uh, I would say, as a military, when we work with other militaries, we we usually have the best technology and we have the most advanced uh, weaponry. But sometimes that's not always what's called for. And sometimes, when we're working with partners and other militaries, uh, a more simpler uh, device or a simpler approach and way is uh, is 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 what it's what's needed. And many of uh, our operations and activities are overseas. We work with partner nations and, and working with them and they know what the local culture is and uh, I think we're better off and we're more efficient and effective as a military when we, we work with the people who are local and, and not try to uh, just say, well, this is the way we would do it in the U.S. So that's a... And problem. there's there's an entire cohort of military officers called foreign area officers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and we see more and more of those in our embassies. These people are excellent. These are American military officers who immerse themselves in a particular country. Um, when I served in Turkey, we had a foreign area officer there who spoke fluent Turkish, knew the Turkish military, knew their operations. And um, in general, when, when we're dealing with partnered operations in the most troubled areas, 
I think it's safe to say that you know, technologically in terms of our institutions, in terms of our equipment, in terms of our practices, the U.S. is probably um, at the top. But what can we learn? Well, we need to learn what the landscape is. We need to learn what's making people tick. Our foreign area, area officers do that. Great. Yes. So we're in the front. With our, if you could just wait for the microphone. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Yusuf Bahami. This is a very insightful discussion indeed. I, uh, um, Could you state your affiliation, please? Yes, I am with an uh, NGO that works uh, in New York area with the UN work in relation to the Yemen conflict, and we specialize in the issues of counterterrorism and peacekeeping and peace building. Thank you. So the first question, and I am very present in DC for events like this, especially for the CSIS that is ranked number one, I think, on uh, defense and uh, national uh, strategy for, for defense. So the question, the first one will be regards what you mentioned earlier regarding the factor of perception. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, people can be helped and the United States can maybe offer more than the UN in terms of uh, technological help of counterterrorism, but it's maybe the conception of uh, history, of culture, of religion that uh, makes the United States blamed more than any other uh, westernized country. For example, France goes to Mali, to Senegal, to Algeria. The colonial ties helps always to blame less the French than the Americans, even if the Americans will help more. I think this is a factor that could be maybe emphasized in a comment back on an answer. Even in World War II, I mean, the Soviets re uh, were allied uh, to, uh, with the U UK and the US to be the Nazis, but Churchill got blames uh, from Stalin ever since the conferences uh, uh, of the post-World War II started, which means the real fight of the Cold War started ever since then, once fascism was off. So the problem of the perception, how to get over it, and maybe blame less the United States for the result that they can help for issues like that. Uh, uh, especially with local uh, communities, uh, sometimes even officials which is really sad, even officials uh, get onto that subjective pattern. And the second question is maybe regarding Yemen, uh, since I follow all the activities of uh, the UNHCR, the WHO, and other agencies of the United Nations system in Yemen, why most of the help is made uh, in the western area of Yemen? Mm. If you look at the map, there is no help whatsoever in the east and the border with Oman. From the U.S. perspective as well, I mean, how the United States can help if it is not uh, in the scope of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Do you want to take the first? What, what was the first? I, I just did. I heard your your question, but I didn't hear a question. I'm sorry. I just yeah. didn't hear. What or if the you want to take the the second one on Yemen, or if anybody has insights into the. Yeah. Well, maybe, like yep. I said, regarding the perception, like you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, that the civilians and even officials of countries like uh, where the United States goes to help yeah. gets blamed for the result, and that yeah. relating that maybe it's more philosophical than technical. Yep. The fact that the ties, uh, historically, uh, yeah. the historical yep. ties mm -hmm. are not big. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a young country. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so, so how our, our partnerships can lead yep. to a, a range of responsibility depending on the yep. nature of the partnership, if, yep. if I can summarize. Yeah. So for, uh, for the Department of Defense, uh, whenever we work with a, a partner, <coughs> again, it depends on the, the country, the culture, and uh, we try to work closely with that uh, local uh, population because uh, we don't want to be look like uh, we're we're not colonizers. We were not colonizers to uh, at any time, and uh, I think that our best uh, opportunities are when we work with our partners and uh, we are transparent in all of our activities and operations, and uh, we comply with international uh, humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict. And by doing that, um, I think that. Uh, that allows us to show the example. And I, again, I don't know what it's one particular country, but uh, if we can set the example, if we're uh, not in a coalition where that uh, our partner is operating all, under all of our uh, rules of engagement, then uh, we set the example. 
and uh, just by working more closely with them, I believe they'll be more effective in, in their protection of civilians. I'm going to take uh, two questions as we are uh, coming to the end of our event today. Uh, the gentleman in the black, back with the blue shirt, and then uh, we'll go over here to the gentleman in the yellow shirt. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, there was a brief mention earlier about, and it was also just hit on the last question, that our partnerships can sometimes make us unpopular with uh, groups on the ground and uh, uh, communities on the ground. Um, and I'm 22 years old and um, pretty much for my entire life we've been, our military's been uh, at war in the Middle East and um, you know obviously many uh, Americans and many, I'm sure everybody in this room knows somebody who has served and uh, there's obviously also been um, an enormous amount of civilians who have died in the conflicts that we've been involved in and I'm curious from the perspective of those uh, on the panel who are in the government and work in the military um, from just a purely strategic perspective like obviously there's a lot of moral questions uh, when it comes to civilian casualties but from a purely strategic perspective how much um, thought and discussion internally goes into uh, the notion of blowback and how um, maybe sometimes even our well-intended actions, when they do result in suffering from some people, that can breed uh, resentment, hostility, extremism, et cetera. How much, um, I'm just curious how much thought and, and discourse goes into to that idea. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman over the yellow shirt, also a question? We'll bundle together. Sorry, Asya. Yeah, the gentleman on the end. If you could just pass the mic down. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you everyone. Eli McCarthy with Georgetown University. Um, I just wanted to bring us back to Amanda's point pretty much at the beginning where she said that, you know, in all armed conflict, there's massive civilian harm, both direct and indirect, right? So there is a, a, a proven practice that's developing um, in South Sudan and Colombia called Unarmed Civilian Protection, and this is done by groups like Nonviolent Peace Force, Peace Brigades International, Cure Violence, and so forth. The U.S. Gov has even had some, a uh, little bit of funding to some of these groups. But what I'm wondering is, it, it really needs to be scaled up, and the U.N. Has, is starting to recognize this in high-level documents. So what can we do um, here at the U.S. government level and with humanitarians to, to scale up this practice? Like, what are some next steps? Um, because they're directly protecting civilians, they're protecting women from getting sexually assaulted in South Sudan at a pretty, uh, pretty noticeable rate. So what are your thoughts on how we can scale that up? Mark, did you want to take the first one? Okay, yeah. I'll take the first one. Yeah, <clears throat> great question. And uh, for, the, for the military, we think about it quite a, quite a lot. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say the answer to your question is a lot. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead. I, look, um, you know, so maybe, maybe there's a criticism there that, that we default too much to, um, to continuing relationships. Well, you know, with, with, with governments, you know, you have to have a relationship with, with the government. I mean, that's, what, that's one of the things our embassies do. We, we try to have, uh, and we, we are very successful in having contacts with a wide range of actors outside of government. Um, there's certainly room for improvement of that, but that's something every embassy does. Um, and, uh, you know, different people can draw the line in different places. So maybe we need more off ramps, maybe we need more sticks. Um, but if you're asking, do we think about it? Yeah. Yeah, we think about it a lot, and it's it's one of those it's one of those dilemmas I talked about, and it's the subject of lots and lots of internal debate. And your your question was about uh, you know U.S. civilian casualties. I think you know causing civilian casualties. Let me just give you two quick. When I started uh, flying, the first thing I did before when I was uh, flying. Uh, the first training, when you're flying down in uh, Pensacola, flying through Mississippi and Alabama, and low-level routes, and if you flew over a, 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 a Walmart or a church, they identified some place. If you overflew that, you, you got it down, and you wouldn't continue, and you wouldn't fly. I tell you that because they would, 
they would start the training was there are places you just can't go. Like in your military, you have to apply, uh, you know, comply with norms and, and rules and no strike lists. And then when I got further advanced in training, uh, every time I went up to an operation, here's a no strike list. Here's the the religious uh, facility, here's a medical hospital, here's a place where we are not going to bomb because we do not want to hurt, harm civilians. Um, there's no, I have never met anyone in the military that was just like, yeah, I just don't care about that. I just want to blow some stuff up and I don't really care about civilians. And so, so I, and I'm saying they're not out there. there. Maybe there are some people that are like, yeah, I don't really care. But you know what? You're less effective. You're not going to be effective if you're killing civilians or if you're not protecting the civilians. I mean, we're fighting ISIS and they're using civilians as, as shields. They're, they're putting women and children up so that they won't get shot. They're, they're not allowing them to leave a city. So when you see destruction and rubble and you see civilian casualties in a city, remember that the reason that that city was under siege is because ISIS, who lived there, were not allowing the people to live their proper life. They weren't allowing the people to even go across the lines to, to get to some safe place. And I know that the NGOs and the great humanitarian assistance people who work in this room that are here, it, you like to be neutral. But all of those humanitarian assistance people, guess where they're coming from? They're coming from our lines. They're coming from the area, the safe havens are provided by usually U.S. coalition and those partners. Now they're, they're neutral and for the DOD, the, the, the door is open. If an NGO wants to talk to us, we're open. If they don't want to talk to us, I totally get it. But realize even these humanitarian organizations and the neutral people, they don't normally, uh, in 2015, the center of Raqqa, there wasn't a humanitarian assistance, uh, you know, NGOs operating and flourishing out <laughs> there, spreading goodness out of, uh, of northeast Syria. No, that was the place where people were having horrible things done to them. And now, in 2018, Raqqa is, is a place that is, is coming back up. And yes, there were, there were civilians who were killed. There was lots of destruction and devastation. But at 22 years old, you get to make a choice. You get to make a choice in your life of, of what the kind of country and world you want to live in and how we can operate with those. And you're asking all the right questions. And if you want to go down to the local recruiting office and <laughs> sign up, I will happily get you into a uh, officer program. And you pick the service of choice, and I'll, I'll write a letter of recommendation for you. <laughs> Man Amanda, did you want to uh, tackle that? Sure, I can try to speak yeah. to the second question. I think um, proven methods to, to enhance protections are something we should certainly invest in. I think, though, we have to be clear about the scale of the problem and the ability of, of, of um, and making sure that the solutions match it and that we are putting energy against solving um, the, the root causes and not just putting band-aids on, on what the problems are. So I'm not being dismissive of those efforts. I think they're important and I think community-led protection is particularly important. Um, but I do think um, you know, one of the things we, we in the humanitarian community like to say is that we can't humanitarian our way out of a lot of the problems that, that we find ourselves in. Um, there are, and there are, they require political solutions to get at those root causes. And so I think um, balancing that reality against grassroots efforts to protect civilians is important, but it's never going to solve a problem until um, we're able to, to solve the political problems that are driving these conflicts. Great. Well, I want to thank you all for, for joining us today. It's clear that security partnerships are a central element in US strategy. And the question is, given this increasing reliance, um, how do we pursue and design these partnerships responsibly? Um, so I really appreciate everyone uh, joining in the discussion today. Please join me in thanking our terrific panel. Thank and. Uh,